I'm Michael Cathcart. I'm the host of Books and Arts Daily on RN, and my guest tonight is the spy thriller writer Dame Stella Remington. Stella is superbly qualified to write about spies because for most of her working life she was a spy for the branch of the secret service known as MI5. She joined in 1968. She resisted the entrenched sexism of the organisation to serve in every major department, counterintelligence, counter-subversion, counter-espionage, and in 1992 she became its first female director general, a post she held until her retirement in 1996. When she did retire, Stella became a writer. She wrote an autobiography called Open Secret and then a series of spy novels featuring her own very Kenny sleuth called Liz Carlyle. Book number six in the series is out. It's called Riptide. Would you please welcome Dame Stella Remington. I think we should explore the truth behind the fiction, Stella, and then uh, talk about your character. T tell us briefly about your growing up, if you would, because you're not the stereotypical intelligence officer with the silver spoon in your mouth, are you? No. Um, I was born uh, just before the Second World War broke out, so you can start adding up how old I must be now. Um, I was... Um, because I was born, you know, and, and brought up during the war, we always lived in places where there was a lot of bombing going on, and so I spent some time in air raid shelters, and I grew up as a rather nervous, anxious sort of young person. I went to university, which wasn't necessarily expected in those days, um, because you, you know, women weren't really expected to have careers. We were expected just to kind of work a little bit until we got married, or at the very most until we had children. But I did go to university. When I came to the end of that, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I went on and took another course and became a historical archivist. So that was my first career. And uh, I was doing that very cheerfully in one of our rural counties. And then I went on to London and got married. And then I gave up my work altogether and went off with my husband, who was a diplomat, uh, to be a diplomat's wife. And that was where my real story yeah. that we're going to talk about began. Well, let's talk briefly about being a diplomat's wife, because you do tell very funny stories about that, how you were given all these instructions about the kind of dresses one would need and how to behave, how to conduct oneself as a diplomat's wife. And really, you weren't quite up for that in a way, were you? Well, not really. I can remember when I wrote my autobiography, I dug out this little brown book that we diplomats' wives were given before we set off on our foreign postings. And it gave you advice about the sort of things you should take with you to India, which is where we were going. And uh, there was one bit of advice which said, a fur wrap will come in useful. <laughs> and it went on to say, rather bossily, shoulders covered with goose pimples are not attractive. <laughs> so, and there was another thing about elastic. It said something about... Um, Waist slips are more useful than full-length slips, but take a supply of elastic. All elastic rots, but Indian elastic rots twice as fast. <laughs> so those were, you know, armed with all this gubbins, I went off to be a diplomat's wife. And as you say, it wasn't really my scene, actually. And I mean, in those days, diplomats' wives, well, British diplomats' wives, weren't allowed to work in the place where they'd gone. So you had to spend your time running coffee mornings and appearing in amateur dramatics, and that's what I was doing. When... And you literally <laughs> did get a tap on the shoulder. Yes, exactly what happened to me. I was doing all those things when one day somebody sidled up to me in the British High Commission compound in Delhi and tapped me on the shoulder and offered me a job. And the job, well, who it was, was the man who was running a very small MI5 office that existed within the British High Commission in Delhi. In those days, MI5 had small offices all over the Commonwealth. Called, they were called security liaison officers, and their job was to advise Commonwealth countries on their security. And the man in Delhi um, had, had too much work to do and recruited me as a part-time clerk typist. And that's, I couldn't actually type, but it didn't seem to matter in those days. It was more about who you were than what you could actually do. And that was how I started my career in And MI5. you could be sure that your elastic wasn't about to give out. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just very briefly cover the history of MI5, because it's important to understand what this organisation is that you ended up running and that you write these books about. So it has its origins in the period just before the First World War. You say a sort of spy mania had developed in Britain. Yes, 1909 
the British intelligence services started. But before that, we didn't have any kind of intelligence、um, at all. And there was a spy mania. Just before the First World War, people became obsessed with the fact that we were. Because we had no intelligence services and we had really no proper defences, all kinds of stories started circulating around about German spies, who were apparently, according to the stories, going around sort of counting the cows in the fields and measuring the bridges and doing all kinds of nasty spyish things. And so, gradually, I think this kind of mania affected the government of the day. And they decided that because we were completely unprepared, we better have some kind of intelligence services. So, two members of the armed forces were told go off and kind of found an intelligence service, and that's what they did. And that's the origin of MI5, which is our defensive intelligence service, and MI6, who are the the ones who go out abroad and find other people's secrets and bring them back home. So this is splendidly British. The, the, the head of MI5 was Captain Kell, yes. And ever afterwards, the head of MI5 was known as K after Captain Kell. So you became K. Is that well,、right? K was actually the head of our counter espionage branch. So I did become K when I was、uh, director of counter espionage. Oh, then you got beyond K. Then you got beyond <laughs> K. That's right. Above K is DG, which is what I became. You're the DG.、Finally. Yes. So Captain Cumming was the other chap. That's right. He founded MI6. So leaders of MI6 were known as C. And they still are known as C. Yes. See, and they, this is marvellous. They're writing green ink still to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's See, all true. Isn't that reassuring? <laughs> I feel so much safer. So who the hell is M? Oh, M exists in the imagination of those people who make James Bond films. So there is no M. No,、nope, there is no M. Oh, so、Except,、dis- of course, if you go to the cinema and watch Judy Dench. I'm so disillusioned. So, okay, so there's MI5, which is domestic intelligence. MI6 is overseas. Yeah. And then there's GCHQ. What, what's that? GCHQ is our technical intelligence service, and their job is to gather intelligence from every form of sort of technical emanation. Don't ask me how they do it. They do it with enormous computers. Um, but they are extremely important in、so、today's technological of, world. They're a kind of listening post. Yeah, they're listening posts.、Yeah. Yes. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, I've always wondered what the answer to this was. So there's MI5 and MI6. What on earth happened to MI1, 2, 3, and 4? <laughs> well, the MI, of course, stands for military intelligence because when they were founded, as you said, military officers were sent off to found them. So. They were given numbers as part of military intelligence, and the other MI were doing other kind of military intelligencey things. But very shortly, of course, they took themselves away from the military and became entirely civilian. And our intelligence services are entirely civilian. They've got no police powers. They've got no military powers. They are entirely civilian. Intelligence gathering and assessing organisations. So, at one stage, there may well have been an MI one or two or three or four. I'm sure there was an MI one, two, three, and four, but I can't tell you what they did. <laughs> perhaps they're and they don't、more. do it anymore, anyway. Or perhaps they do. Ah, who knows? Perhaps know, there was something、I'm... you were never told. <laughs> well, I'm sure they're called something else, anyway. <laughs> All right. So you come back to London and you join MI five in London. As you make clear, MI five was a rather eccentric outfit. When you joined, really very old school tie. Yes. And、um, a, a recurring theme of the novels, your novels, is of Liz Carlyle confronting the sexism of her colleagues. You say that when you joined, it was a two-tiered system. It even had different career paths for men and for women.、Can、yes, you it、that? did. MI5 I joined was run entirely by men, and there were women working there, but they were mainly working. To do with the papers, we were supposed to stay at our desks and help the men, and really sort out the papers. And there were two career structures: the men were the officers, even though it was a civilian organisation. You know, if you think about them as the officers, and the women were the other ranks. And when I joined, actually, you know, in the headquarters in London, which was really, as the 60s turned into the 70s, there was really no way of transferring from one to the other. The women were definitely regarded as the second-class citizens.、Mm. On our end, you're listening to Books and Arts Daily, coming to you from an event convened by the Wheeler Centre at the Comedy Theatre in Melbourne. I'm Michael Cathcart, and my guest is Dame Stella Remington, who was Director General of MI5 from 1992 to 1996, the first woman to hold that office. You say, Stella, that you did not feel a particular urge to serve my country. 
I was averagely patriotic, but I didn't even feel a strong sense of dangers to the state to be tackled or of wrong to be righted. So why did you join? I think I joined because it, was, it looked to me to be more interesting than being a historical archivist, which was <laughs> the career that I started out at. I cut my teeth in Delhi, um, as I mentioned. It was the height of the Cold War, and India was one of the forefronts of the Cold War, where East met West. And there was a lot of spying going on in India in those days. So I had already, before we came back to London, I had experience of the sort of thing that was going on. You know, the, as I say, the place was full of spies from both sides of the divide of the Cold War. So I thought it looked interesting and possibly exciting, but I didn't, as I said in my autobiography, have much sense of what the threats to the country where. I mean, when I joined, nobody explained really what MI5 did. I just sort of, as I say, I was tapped on the shoulder, offered this job. The bloke who offered me the job showed me a tiny little pamphlet, which was the only thing that was publicly known really in those days about MI5, which said, MI5's job is to protect the security of the state. And really that was it. So that was what I joined knowing. So, you know, the thought that I, you know, might have had a kind of clear idea of what the threats to the state were or some burning desire to protect us is, is myth. I didn't. You're right. I was still romantically dreaming about the great game. Yes. Now that's, a, that's a wonderful phrase. And yes. it's a phrase I don't think is now in currency. Perhaps you could explain it to us. Yes, well, the great... Uh, I, the reason I say that is that just before... I joined, I got my tap on the shoulder. I had been with my husband and a couple of friends on a marvellous journey where we drove from Delhi through Pakistan over the Khyber Pass to Kabul. And I, in, a, in preparation for this, I'd been reading Kipling's Kim, which is this fantastic book written, I think in 1901, about spying on the northwest frontier. And it's all about the, the sort of... Um, I suppose the battle between Russia, Germany and Britain for influence in that part of India on the northwest frontier. And it's about spies, basically. I mean, Kim was a small boy who came across spies, a spying operation. And I thought, when somebody said, you know, MI5, I thought it was all going to be about British officers disguised as horse traders on the northwest <laughs> frontier. So that was my romantic idea, uh, insofar as I had any idea of what it was I was joining. So, anyway, we've come back to London now, and one of the things that you describe in the London setup are these circles of secrecy, and you, as you explain, they're clearly important, but they're also crippling in some ways. Yes, um, you're talking about the need to know, yes. which still exists, of course, and it means that really in those days the whole ethos of MI5 was far more about not telling anybody anything unless they had a proven need to know it. And that was carried, really, in those days, to rather ridiculous extremes, actually. No, but, I mean, we, I don't think we ever saw the Director General when I first joined, for example. You know, the idea that you had joined an organization where you kind of knew broadly what was going on or what the policy of the organization was, was for the birds in those days. You didn't. You did your own little thing. You were aware that there was all sorts of stuff going on, but you, didn't, you weren't told about it. And that was the need to know. And obviously, in those days, um, you know, it inhibited um, a commonsensical uh, approach to work because you can't actually run an organization if you're more concerned about the need to know than you are about the need to communicate. And it was that balance as the years w rolled on that we had to get right. So you might have a bit of a puzzle and not even know that someone else has got the rest of the puzzle. That could have happened, actually, yes. I mean, the reason for it is, you know, sensible when you think about it, provided it's not carried to extremes, because obviously the more people who know, if you're running a sensitive operation, the less secure it is. And there is a reason, obviously, for secrecy, but you must be very careful that you don't carry it to extremes. Mm. Now, we're talking about the Cold War, so what's MI5 actually doing during the Cold War? Let, let's, you know, concentrate on the late 50s, early 60s. What's going on? Well, during the Cold War, of course, the major threat to the security of the West came from the Soviet Union and their allies and their efforts at espionage to find out secrets that would help them if the Cold War ever turned to a fighting war and subversion as they tried to undermine Western democracies and spread world communism. So what we were trying to do in MI5 in those days 
was find out what the hostile intelligence services, who were present in our, all of our Western capitals in large numbers in those days, find out who they were, what they were doing, and try and scupper their operations, either recruit them to our side to tell us what was going on inside their own organizations, or get them expelled from the country and prosecute their, their spies. So that was primarily what we in MI5 were doing. We were trying to protect the country against the threat that came from our enemies of the Cold War. Now, one of the themes of many, much of the fiction is the theme of the double agent, the person who's inside the organisation who may be trading secrets with the Russians. And, of course, there were such double agents, and there were people who, um, there were people who defected. And your own work was involved at some stage in the defection of Burgess and McLean and later Kim Philby in 63. In fact, you had two cats called Burgess and McLean. Yes, I did, yes. <laughs> so were they an unhealthy obsession with, with the organisation or, or was there a real threat there that had to be followed up? There was a real threat, obviously, from the infiltration of one side's intelligence services by the other because the greatest jewel in the crown for the KGB or for MI6 ourselves was to get uh, somebody inside the opposing intelligence service who was reporting to you, was telling you what was going on. And you've mentioned Burgess, Philby and McLean, who were before my time actually, but they were recruited as young men uh, while they were at university and they infiltrated significant parts of the British establishment and reported to the Soviet Union for years about what was going on and passed vast numbers of documents, etc., and negated a great deal of the work of MI6 at the time because uh, Philby, of course, was the head of one of the sections in MI6. So this was a real threat, and on both sides, we did succeed. I mean, they succeeded there. Uh, we succeeded in, in other cases, and, you know, that was, that was told you the best kind of information because even today... The best information comes from human beings, people, deep in the heart of whatever it is that's threatening the country, who you can recruit to your side, persuade to stay where they are, and pass you a stream of information about what's going on. And, you know, that really is the jewel in the crown of, of espionage. Stella, did it raise the possibility or the fear that there were potentially other people in the organisation oh, who yes. were doing what they'd done? Yes. I mean, my first job, actually, uh, was in a section where we were trying to see whether there were other people who had been recruited when they were young at university, like Burgess, Philby and McLean, who might still be in place in the British civil service. In the end, you know, the years rolled on, and if there had been such people, they would have been, you know, approaching retirement age. So we gave up that work when other more important work came along. But, you know, it was an abiding fear, actually, and it probably... You know, it took a lot of our resources, perhaps longer than it should have done, with this anxiety that maybe we'd missed something that dated right back to the 1930s. Mm. So as you're rising through the organisation, let's enter the 70s now, you've had a daughter. How are you juggling your private life, you know, your married life, with family life, with the job? Uh, with a certain amount of difficulty. Um, in those days, there was no part-time work. Job shares had never been heard of. And if you were an intelligence officer, and by then I was, because by the time I had my first daughter, um, I was you know, beginning to kind of move into slightly more important work than I'd done when I first started. And so it was difficult. I mean, I went back to work um, three months after my first daughter was born. And, um, you know, as I say, there was no, no part-time or anything. And it was very difficult. And I suppose, like all mothers, I felt guilty all the time that I wasn't, you know, looking after my daughter. We're talking about the 70s, and it wasn't fashionable in those days for mothers to work. And people did make you feel guilty, including my own mother, actually, who didn't think it at all proper that I'd gone back to work. She thought I should be at home looking after my daughter. So, you know, there was this kind of split personality that I had, but... By then, I was quite involved in the work I was doing, and I wanted to go ahead. Uh, I wanted to get on, because we were just approaching the period where women were beginning to break through in the service. So were you the sort of resident feminist, sort of <laughs> show, you know, mm. beating a path that the others would follow? Well, there were a number by then of women like me who'd had a good education, 
and were, you know, almost indistinguishable from the men who were being recruited. We had university degrees. We'd done something else, most of us. And by, I suppose, as the 70s began to wear on women's lib, uh, sex discrimination legislation, and we started to say to our bosses, hey, hang on a minute, why are we in this kind of subservient role? We think we could do the sharp end work of the service as well as the men. And they sort of scratched their heads and puffed their pipes and couldn't really think of a reason why. Perhaps we couldn't. And so uh, they decided that they would have to try some of us out and see whether we could. And then, of course, we had the job of proving that what we thought we could do, we actually mm. could do. Well, feminism is in the air. There's a good deal of reform in the air in the 70s. Actually, a lot of revolutionary rhetoric around. Pop music traded on it. Che Guevara is a sort of icon for youth rebellion. Did, did the Soviet Union try to co-opt those social movements, those reform movements, to its ends, in your view? Um, yes, up to a point, actually. Um, certainly the Communist Party of Great Britain tried to infiltrate CND, for example, um, some of the unions, and um, were trying to get for themselves, supported by the Soviet Union, an influence which they couldn't possibly have got through the ballot box. So the Soviet Union, supporting com communist parties in all kinds of Western countries, were trying to kind of push communism into being you know, a much more popular kind of political movement than left to itself it would ever have been. So do you see the CND, the great anti-nuclear movement, as a kind of dupe, or do you see it as a genuine organisation with genuine and legitimate objectives? Oh, yes. No, it was undoubtedly a genuine organisation with genuine legitimate objectives, and it was joined by genuine people who genuinely felt, um, you know, that nuclear weapons were a bad thing. But... As well as that, of course, it was a movement that was of advantage to our enemies during the Cold War, and particularly if the war had ever become a fighting war, because if, if you can persuade countries not to arm themselves in the same way as you are armed, then obviously you have an advantage. So, you know, this was a classic way of kind of infiltrating and, and persuading perfectly legitimate, good, honest people not, not to change their mind and not to support a foreign country, but to go on doing what they're doing, while as well as that, you feed in people who are trying to udge the thing over to uh, favour the Soviet Union, as it was. So politics in the 70s is much more polarised than it is now. I mean, the, the Labour Party in both Britain and Australia was more of a left-wing party than it is now. We, you know, parties are now more of the centre. So people who are on the side of reform like to imagine that, in fact, that the security services have a file on them. It's a, it's a sort of badge of honour to think yeah. that you're under surveillance because you must have been at the barricades for some great cause. If one was a member of the CND, is it likely that your organisation had taped phone calls or got photographs of you or developed a no. dossier on you? I mean, you have to remember that um, security services in Western democracies are quite small. And the idea that they're, you know, kind of taping everybody and opening files on everybody is a complete myth. I mean, even, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't have the resource to do it. They have to focus their attention on the things that are real threats to uh, national security. I mean, if you look at it from the other point of view, if you look at the KGB, for example, it was enormous. Or the Stasi in East Germany. I mean, those are the kind of organisations that could monitor everybody and wanted to and did. Whereas in Western democracies, uh, you know, these organisations are comparatively small and uh, are focused, I can tell you, very sharply on the things that they've assessed as genuine threats to the security of the state, whatever people like to think about the fact that there are fouls on everybody. What about the way in which the temperature changes when a reform government is elected or, or, as opposed to a conservative government? Does the Secret Service you know, lock up files and hide filing cabinets and so on when a reform government is in power and heave a sigh of relief when the Tories are back <laughs> at number 10? No, none of that happens, <laughs> much though you might like to think it does. No, no, I mean, life goes on. I mean, well, in Britain anyway, the government does not direct what the security service does. The security service tells the government what the threats to our national security are, 
and gives them、uh, information about why that's, they've made that assessment. And the government provides them with the necessary funding to protect the country. So, I certainly have absolutely no knowledge of any time when any government tried to tell the head of Britain's security service what to do.、Um, and I think if they had, they'd have been told, you know, no, we can't do it. It's not within our charter.、Mm. The other story that's often told in films is how the security services knock off people who are a threat to the state. So you send out a sharpshooter to assassinate somebody, and、uh, you know, O Seven has a license to kill.、Um, the classic British TV series Callan with Edward Woodward was really about a, a reluctant Secret Service hitman.、Um, the the Lacare film Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy ends with Bill Hayden, Colin Firth, being assassinated by a former colleague. Did that kind of thing go on? <laughs> what do you want me to say there? <laughs> I want you to tell me the truth. The truth, of course. There's a bright light shining、say. in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, British intelligence has no license to kill.、Um, so James Bond is a total myth.、Um, so no, I mean, assassination operations do not take place, and that's really all there is to say about it. The, uh, in your new novel, you give the impression, which is also a feature, I must say, the TV series speaks that the the British Secret Service is very punctilious and very restrained, and that the US agencies are much more gung ho and a bit incautious in the way they conduct themselves.、Um, you do tell a story about when you came to a briefing in Australia of various intelligence services that the US were practicing a level of security which you thought was excessive. Yes,、um, I, we had a.、Um A meeting of closest allies、um, during the Cold War in Australia,、um, and、uh, we were on an island, and there was security all around. And yet, the head of the CIA and the head of the FBI were followed about by their own posse of security men, closely guarding them, which seemed to me absolutely ludicrous and totally excessive. But of course, when you think about it, these guys were paid to、uh, guard the head of the CIA and the FBI, and that was their job, and that was what they were going to do. So that was the、uh, origin of that particular little story. One of the features of the Cold War is that it divided the world into two camps: there was freedom and there was tyranny. So there was a tendency by some people to engage in kind of binary thought. There was only the good and the bad, and it's always seemed to me that one of the dangers of any kind of intelligence work, and in fact also of history, because my trade is as a historian, is that you get drawn into this idea that there are only two camps, and that everyone who's against us is somehow in league. Is that a kind of conspiracy view of the world that you have to guard against when you're in, in intelligence? Is it a habit of mind you've got to check yourself for? It's not a habit of mind that I entirely recognise. I'm. I mean, when you're in an intelligence organisation, you're actually focused on the threats and gathering information about the threats, and analysing what you've learned and working out what you're going to do about it. You don't spend an awful lot of time, really, thinking kind of philosophically about the way the world divides into good and bad. You're very, very focused on. You know whether it's during the Cold War on espionage or nowadays on terrorism. You're focused on where is the threat to the country and what are we going to do about it, and how do we understand it, etc. So there's not a, a lot of time for kind of philosophical brooding about、uh, you know the good and the bad, really. Well, the bad did fall over in 1991. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. The Berlin Wall, of course, came down in 1989. The collapse of the Soviet bloc seems to have come as a complete surprise to everybody. Did you have a sense that that communism was about to come crashing down? No, I don't think we did. I mean, it seems strange when we were an intelligence service, but quite frankly, I don't think there was any. You know, there wasn't much to see until everybody could see it, as the countries of Eastern Europe started, you know, to collapse and and for, go into kind of revolutionary mode. And then ultimately the Soviet Union as well. It was all there for everyone to see, and the, I don't think there was. There wasn't things to pick up actually. But it was for us. I mean, it was a very dramatic time, as you can imagine. These people, you know, had been our enemies. These nations had been the threats all my working life, and then all of a sudden you saw them changing. And I mean, we、um, sat down and thought. 
you know, what are we, how are we going to kind of capitalize on this new situation? We decided, particularly with the countries of Eastern Europe, that we would set about trying to make these new democracies our friends. So we made contact with uh, um, people who'd been our enemies all my working life. And we f I found myself in the headquarters of the Bulgarians and the Poles and the Czechs talking about what we'd been trying to do to each other during the Cold War and sort of advising them on how to restructure their intelligence services to work in democracies. Sorry, do you mean you sat around sort of slapping your thighs and saying, you'll never guess what we did to your lot? And they said, well, no. you think that's good, you should know <laughs> what we got away with on our side. Not quite. I mean, we weren't so talking about specific operations. But as you can imagine, uh, you know, when you suddenly are in the headquarters of a country that you never thought to visit, and certainly talking to people that you never thought to meet, yeah. there is a certain, uh, you know, kind of amazement uh, and, uh, and a certain jocularity certainly develops, and much whiskey and vodka was drunk far into the <laughs> night, I can tell you, on, in those occasions. And troops of Poles and Bulgarians and whatever came through our training, um, uh, training sections because the deal we struck, really, was that we would help them um, to adapt to being working in democracies, and they would stop spying on us, and they would help us understand these terrorist organizations that were active at the time, many of whom the communist countries had actually supported as a way of getting at the West. So there were deals to be done there, and uh, that's what we did. And it was very successful, actually. And on RN, you're listening to Books and Arts Daily with Michael Cathcart, and we're on stage at the Comedy Theatre at an event organised by the Wheeler Centre talking to Dame Stella Remington. Uh, the former head of MI5. You became the head of MI5 in 1992, which is the year after the Soviet Union collapsed. And um, you were unusual in opening MI5 to public gaze. How did that come about? Well, when I was appointed Director General, uh, and it wasn't a job I'd applied for in those days, um, you just got told you've got the job sort of thing. So I was told one day, you're going to be the next Director General, and almost by the way, the government's decided that on your appointment, we're going to announce your name. And I was quite taken aback by this. This was the first time that the head of any of our intelligence services had been publicly named. The reason the government decided to do it was partly because by then we had legislated for our intelligence services. When I joined MI5, there was no law that covered our work. We worked by virtue of a sort of compact uh, or agreement with each incoming government about broadly what we would do. But by the 1990s, during the 1980s, we legislated, we passed laws to co cover the work of the intelligence services. And so I was the first to be appointed under those laws. And so the government decided the public had a right to know. So there I was, a woman in a man's job, as the press saw it. Suddenly the press had this fantastic announcement uh, about this woman that they knew absolutely nothing about. And, uh, as you can imagine, an enormous sort of press furore broke out as they tried to find out who is this woman in a man's job and, uh, you know, why haven't we got a photograph of her? And so they came and they found out everything they possibly mm. could about us. Well, the world was changing, communism was coming to an end, but a new threat was developing and that threat was terrorism. And you, you, the British already had experience of terrorism because the IRA had been blowing things up, not just in Ireland but also in in London. Um, but Liz Carlyle, in the latest book, utters this line. She says, for the intelligence world, 9-11 changed everything. How did it change everything? Well, by the time I retired, we had already seen, I suppose, the beginnings of um, the kind of terrorism that my former colleagues are dealing with now. We had seen just the start of sort of Islamist groups, particularly coming out of North Africa in those days. But mostly, of course, we were focusing on the IRA, who were still very active when I retired. Then, by, uh, after I retired, along came 9-11. And, of course, what that did, I mean, leave aside the American reaction for the moment, but I think what 9-11 did was draw to everyone's attention the fact that terrorism could do dreadful and appalling things and that, um, you know, we, we were in a completely new world. And I think what Liz Carlyle means when she says it changed everything was, as a result of the American reaction, the declaration of a war on terrorism 
and the um, immense sort of public focus, the political focus on intelligence services and what they do and how you react to terrorism was a complete change, I think, from the, from the way in which we'd been dealing with terrorism until then. Mm. One of the wonderful creations in the book is the elegant and nonchalant um, Mr. Fain, Geoffrey Fain, the very haughty chap from MI6. And he visits Mr. Bocas, who runs the London office of the CIA, working out of the US Embassy. And it's pretty clear that they don't like each other, but they're determined to resist terrorism. And Bocas talks about the problem of terrorists finding a safe haven in Yemen or Somalia, which is a nuisance, he points out, since the Americans are fighting terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he says, we don't want them taking root all over the place or it defeats the purpose of our military campaigns. And you write this precisely, thought Fain, who had never been gung-ho about either the Iraq or the Afghan adventures. To him, Al-Qaeda was a global movement that used criminal means. It was best tackled through intelligence and, when necessary, specifically applied force, not with the blunderbuss of NATO's military might, unless the US and its allies were going to be happy to fight, quote, a war against terror on 50 fronts. But Bocas obviously didn't agree, so Fain merely nodded. Are you expressing your own views there? Yes, to an extent I am expressing my own view, which is that um, terrorism is a crime and should be uh, ultimately uh, pursued by police intelligence methods, uh, the idea being that you are uh, trying to bring the terrorists into the courts and uh, try them, and if they're found guilty, put them in prison. That's my view, and the British view, really, of how you deal with terrorism, which is different from the American view, which is that you are fighting a war against terrorists and that uh, you know, the, the civil courts are not really the place uh, for trying terrorists. So, yeah, I am expressing my view. And are you opposed to that on, on the basis of ethics or because you think that the American strategy is counterproductive? Uh, both, I think, really. I think it is counterproductive. I think um, uh, the declaration of a war on terror um, hasn't really been a very successful way of dealing with terrorists. You end up with Guantanamo Bay and people that you really don't know what to do with. But you also um, end up, I think, as um, almost a recruiting sergeant for young men who feel aggrieved by the way uh, the war on terror is being conducted and find themselves, as in the book, turning to terrorism themselves because they have this grievance. So it adds to the sense of grievance. Yes, it's raising so. the temperature, yes. in your view. I think so. Mm. What made you want to write fiction? Well, it's something I'd always thought about doing. Um, I've always been a reader of spy stories, uh, you know, adventure stories, that kind of thing, all my life. And uh, having had the career I've had, I often used to think, hmm, I'd quite like to try my hand at this. But of course, it's not the kind of thing you can do when you're working in an intelligence service. So it was something you know, I had in the back of my mind. What I'd never thought I would do was write my autobiography. And strangely enough, um, that's what I ended up doing first. And then the, the novels came later. And when I retired, lots of publishers wrote to me and said, oh, we'd love to publish your memoirs. And I wrote back and said, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. You know, it's all too secret. And that was where it rested until about five years after I retired when one summer when I wasn't doing anything very much I thought mm, maybe I'll just have a try at writing my autobiography and I started and I went on with it and in the end I finished it and I sent it into the clearance process which exists for people like me or any public servant in Great Britain who wants to write their memoirs or anything else really you have to have it cleared so I sent it in to be cleared, and there was a sort of deathly silence in Whitehall. You could almost hear the corporate gasp coming out of Whitehall as they wondered what on earth to do, because I'd written it very carefully. It was not full of the nation's secrets at all. It was my life story, and yet they were anxious about this. And so there was this deathly silence until one day somebody in the clearance process broke cover and put this completely uncleared manuscript into a brown paper envelope and sent it to the Sun newspaper, which is one of our most tabloid of tabloids. 
and they didn't know what to do with it, so they put it back in another brown paper envelope <laughs> and sent it to Number 10 Downing Street in a taxi with a press photographer, and that started a huge, great sort of press furore about whether I should be allowed to do this or shouldn't be allowed to do it. And uh, you know, achieved vast publicity, which I would never have achieved if I'd tried. <laughs> And、um, in the end, it, it was clear. I was asked to make a few adjustments, but not very many. And I published it. And so that was the beginning of my writing career, which began in a way I hadn't intended, actually. You say in that biography, "All my life, I've felt that showing emotion is somehow a bit of a weakness. Emotions are what other people <laughs> are allowed." To have and show, have you become freer with your emotions since you became a novelist? Yes, I'm sure I have. I mean, that refers back to the fact that I had a Yorkshire father and a Lancashire mother, and、um, who had a strong sense of duty. Particularly, my father, who'd fought in the First World War, and was a very sort of stiff upper lip kind of chap. And through the war, you know, when we'd been bombed and heaven knows what all. It was, you know, he kept us all on the straight and narrow. We, there was no panicking. There was no kind of emoting or generally carrying on. We just got on with it. And you were supposed to,、um, you know, duty was very important. And I think that attitude really is something I inherited. But as I've got older, I think I've got freer actually, and now I can emote away with the best of us. <laughs> <laughs> just before we open for questions, there is one last thing I wanted to ask you, and that's about China. So the Cold War ended with the collapse of the USSR, and we all talked as though communism had come to an end. But China is still there. Has intelligence taken its eye off China, or is what went on in Russia still going on in China in relation to you know activities of the intelligence services? Well, I'm sure intelligence has not taken its eye off China or off Russia. I would say,、um, because、uh, we hear that there are as many Russian intelligence officers in London now as there were during the Cold War. So espionage goes on, and espionage from China goes on too. I'm quite sure. And、um, well, I mean, China, yes, is communist, but it's a very curious kind of communism. But China has always been known for gathering information. Um, of all kinds, through all means, not only through their intelligence services. So I'm quite sure that what's going on in China is of、uh, very considerable interest to my former colleagues and、uh, the other service. And I'm quite sure that what's going on in London and everywhere else is of great interest to the Chinese as well. Let's bring the lights up and、uh, get some questions from the audience. So there's a couple of microphones either side. So if you pop your hand up, so I can see you, which I can now do, we can. Invite you to ask a question. Now, don't be shy. There's one right there, or、oh, no, <laughs> up the back there. I'll get you in a minute. Hello.、Um, I read in a recent interview with Daniel Craig that he considered the casting of James Judi Dench as、um, a stroke of genius because of the, I guess, the maternal resilience she brought to the role. I know. Because of the, sorry, the maternal. Can you speak more slowly? It's just a bit hard to hear you. Sorry, the、um, the maternal resilience that she brought to the role. I know it's a fictional example, but how would you describe the unique contributions that women have brought to the intelligence community? I think women have brought a unique contribution to the intelligence community. Not necessarily Judy Dench, but.、Um, Real, real women、um, in the intelligence community, and I think it is—it's the contribution of diversity. And I think in any organisation, be it a company, be it a government department, or whatever, you need the diversity of approach which you get from having both men and women、um, who are different. I mean, I've worked on the boards of companies that were where there was only one woman,、um, and you know, you don't get the diversity of approach. That you get if you have both sexes working in anything, and I think women, you know, brought ver- the th- kind of things that we talk about as the kind of female skills are very important when you're dealing with human beings. And as I said earlier, some of the best intelligence still comes from human beings, and women have a certain way of getting information. From people, and also a kind of ruthlessness, which is a female quality, as well as all the other softer things. So I think you need both sexes. You need you need them in any organisation. You spoke、uh, earlier about、um, 
not necessarily having files on everybody who's been to a political march or or, um, or been an activist in one way or another, and that uh, there are high-level threats, I guess, to the state that um, that the security services were focused on um, in the UK. What would you say during your time as Director General were the top three um, threats that, that you would have been focused on? Well, during my time as Director General, um, the top threat to the security of Britain came from the activities of the IRA um, and co coming out of the situation in Northern Ireland. Um, just before I became Director General, the IRA successfully launched a mortar at Number 10 Downing Street when the Prime Minister, John Major, was having a cabinet meeting, for example, and there were all kinds of other incidents. So that was certainly um, the, the top focus when I became Director General. We were still concerned about espionage because it was still going on uh, when I became Director General from various sources. We were concerned about um, the spread of weapons of mass destruction to countries like Iran, for example, North Korea. So those were things that were concerning us as well. Uh, and we were concerned about, the, the, as I said earlier, the beginnings of this new form of Islamist terrorism that was coming out of um, North Africa. So I suppose those were the main threats to the security of the state, really. Uh, when I became Director General. Over here. Uh, hello, my name's Lisa. Um, I'd like to speak to you about the TV show Spooks. Um, I am a fan of the show, but it annoys me that everything's done and dusted in an hour, and there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's no intelligence gaps, there's no uh, waiting for information or, or uh, joining the dots. Was this uh, unrealistic viewpoint part of the catalyst for you to write about your career? Um, yes, uh, to be frank. I thought it was time um, that we kind of rescued the spy story from the men in the same way as we had managed to rescue the intelligence services from the men too. But yes, it was. I do get very annoyed by shows like Spooks, I must say. And I know they're very popular, but an awful lot of people think that they really are quite accurate, and it's very worrying, actually, because you're quite right. Every week, a very small group of people go off and save the nation from some hideous threat, putting themselves at vast danger as they do so. And, I mean, one of the key things about running a successful intelligence service is that you do not put your operatives in huge amounts of danger. You use your trade craft to protect them. When they go out into potentially dangerous situations, you surround them with all the sort of protective trade craft that you have to try and make sure, to the best of your ability, that they come home safe. So everything behind spooks is wrong, actually. Um, and it is very annoying. Um, and when I, um, when I started writing my novels, I did want to try and make them as accurate as possible up to a point, but you have to be a bit careful because, you know, a lot of intelligence work is about sitting and thinking, basically, you know, and analysing what you've learned and trying to make sense of it and deciding what you're going to do about it. And that doesn't make for a very exciting thriller. So you do have to add drama, but I try to add my drama in a way that is actually realistic and not in a spooks-like way. Stella, one of the other themes of spooks is that the senior officers have really suffered a kind of mo moral hollowing out. Quite right. You know, they're so compromised that they're, they're barely clinging on to their sense of humanity anymore. Well, I know, and I mean, that's quite shocking. The, the kind of moral standards of spooks are appalling. And, you know, one of the things that <laughs> I feel very strongly about is that the ethos of certainly of the British intelligence service is actually r rather good. You know, it's not full of people who are sleeping with the enemy and, and you know, going around in extremely dodgy relationships. So, yeah, you're quite right. Uh, I mean, the whole thing, nah. Don't talk about. <laughs> in the front here. G'day. Uh, with regards to your tenure as the Director General, uh, how detached or how involved were you w with regards to the 
so-called spy on the street. Uh, I guess there's many levels between you and the, um, the spy on the street and uh, um, gathering of information. How, how did you uh, keep your uh, nose on the on the ground and to know everything about? Uh, yeah, we've got that. That's a good question. How how did I um, know what was going on? Is that yeah? Basically well, it? I mean, how were you a hands-on kind of boss? I guess is right. The question. Okay. When um, when you're director general, of course, you don't have your hands on every operation that's going on, but you do have your hands on, or at least you don't have your hands on, but you do know about the important operations. But the job of the director general is basically to run the organisation to deal with the government, to deal with government ministers, to make sure that you have the resources necessary for the organization to do the job that it's doing, to make sure that the ethos of the organization, the ethic, uh, is, is correct, and to, to take the responsibility when things go wrong. And that's basically what the leader of any organization actually has to do. But you do have your, uh, uh, at least you know about um, the, ser the serious, the significant operations that are going on, yes. Because we've got time for a couple more, so we've got one here. Um, trust and respect are fundamental uh, human resources and, and important to any kind of social and human organisation and I interactions. And yet, in your work in Lucares, um, there's always a mole in M15 or 6 or whatever, and you yourself have just talked about the possibility of um, always trying to draw the enemy over to your side, and I guess the reverse happens. So it occurs to me, how, how could anything ever happen? How, how did you know who to trust? Well, you know who to trust within your own organisation um, because, uh, you know, of the ethos and the ethic uh, of the organisation itself. Um, and also, of course, uh, if the worst comes to the worst, because um, people are carefully vetted and, um, and you, know, um, you, know, you know who they are and what they're doing. There is, um, if, if you're looking for moral dilemmas, I suppose the moral dilemma comes with the recruitment of human sources when you are asking somebody, be it a terrorist or a member of a, another intelligence service to betray their own in order to tell you what's going on. And that's where the moral dilemma comes. And the answer to the dilemma really is how serious is the harm that you're trying to prevent. And that, I think, um, sort of qualifies the extent of risk that you are justified in asking somebody else to take. So th I think that's the main moral dilemma in the work, if that really was your question. Just two more. There's one there, and then we'll take one uh, over there. Um, just a, a more um, levity. Uh, during your time at MI5, did you ever come across or hear about a KGB guy called Putin? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually hear about Putin while I was working, no. I believe he was working in Germany, and I never came across him. Um, but uh, I think we've all come across him now, and um, looking at him, I think he reminds me of some of the KGB men I met when I first went to Moscow in, in December 1991 to make our first contact with the KGB. I don't believe he was there, but there were men sitting across the table from us who looked very like Putin looks. There's something about the way he carries himself, is there? Yeah, it's where he takes his shirt off and shows us his muscles. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's one over there. Um, can we get a microphone over here? Oh, yes, there we are. Uh, before you were announced as the Director General, who knew that you were a spy? Were there a lot of people quite close to you who were very surprised? A lot of people were very surprised, actually, because like everybody else in the service, I'd never talked about what I did. Even my daughters didn't know what I did. Um, and so, yes, there were people, friends I'd had for a long time, who were very surprised, and some of whom didn't like it. There was one, my oldest friend, actually, whom I was at school with, took really quite serious offence when my name was announced as the DG, because she'd never known what work I did. And um, she thought, you know, I, I had been, in a sense, well, I had, um, not just, you know, not being open and honest. So it is very difficult, actually, because even now, 
of course. Nobody except the heads of the service are publicly named, and they do have to live a double life, and that is the, I suppose, the downside of, of the interest and excitement of the work that they do. What did you tell these people you were doing? I, did, I said I worked in a government department, I worked for the Ministry of Defence, that kind of thing. Uh, it is very difficult because, you know, your neighbour invites you to their Christmas drinks and you know that if you go, the first thing anybody's going to say to you is, what do you do? And you have to make up some story for the evening about how you buy boots for the army or you're the PR for a cosmetics company or something. But whatever you've decided to be for the evening, you're going to meet somebody who is it or, you know, whose uncle works in the Ministry of Defence or something like that. So it is difficult, and in a way it has the effect of possibly sometimes, you know, making people kind of withdraw from the normal sort of um, private life which most people have, and, and that can be difficult, particularly for young people just starting out. It's time to draw the proceedings to an end. In a minute I'm going to thank Stella, and when I've done that I'd like you to applaud as if you've gone completely mental because we're recording this for ABC Radio National and it's time for you to do your job as the radio, as the radio audience. Would you thank Dame Stella Remington?